Welcome back to Understanding Economics. In our last section, we saw that we couldn't explain the problem of persistent poverty in society with any lack of ability to produce wealth. If people have access to resources, they can produce all the wealth they need. And yet poverty persists and deepens as society gets more productive. The problem of poverty has to be a matter of the distribution of wealth in society. And that's what we take up today. We're going to set up a model to look at the forces that influence the distribution of wealth over time as a society develops. And for our example, we're going to use a familiar image. We're going to explore what happens when a place like this becomes a place like this. The island of Manhattan, one of the best locations in the world, the best place in the world, some people will say, although it could be a whole lot better. Here's an image of downtown Manhattan from a website called the Manhattan Project, which used an advanced terraforming software to come up with a very detailed image of what the island of Manhattan looked like before any European settlement took place. It's a very worthwhile website to check out. And here you see that real estate in Manhattan is so incredibly valuable that people have actually built a little bit more of it. Here's how the shoreline has expanded over the years. We're going to zoom in on the downtown tip of Manhattan where settlement began from the Dutch back in the 1600s. And we're going to use this to begin to develop a model of our economy. Now, exploring distribution with a model is very useful because we can simplify and look at the basic principles, crossing out complicating factors, focusing on the fundamental principles. Models can be tested by comparing the predictions they make with real world observations. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a model of distribution using the island of Manhattan as an example. OK, so with that in mind, let's proceed with our model. And we're going to start where settlement began on the downtown tip of Manhattan Island, which is a pretty great place to settle because it has fertile land. It's a great harbor at the confluence of two rivers, an ideal spot. So the first settlers arrive and they fence off pieces of land because as good Europeans, they want to keep the wealth that they produce on this land. Now, the first settler could have settled anywhere along that coast. They just picked a spot. But when the second settler came along, that person's choice was much clearer because the best place for them to settle was next door to someone who was already there. You can see the benefits right away of community, of people gathering together. Now, we put a number of nine on these. That's an arbitrary number that we're going to use for comparison in our model. And what it means that is that in a given unit of time, the average person can produce that much wealth, that many units of wealth on that land. This is nine land, and we're going to just use these numbers for the purpose of comparison as we go. A little bit more time passes. Word goes out that Manhattan Island is a nice place to settle, and a few more settlers come. They settle on equal quality land. Everyone who comes there using that land along the coast has the same potential opportunity. But there are grades of land. There are different locations, and some locations have advantages over others. Maybe they're a little closer to the coast. Maybe the land is flatter. Maybe the land is more fertile. Whatever the advantage is, when all of the very best land in, the, in the, that location is taken up, the next settlers must resort to land that is of slightly lower quality. It's still good. They can still make a good living there. But because of the slight disadvantages, we'll say they can only make eight units of wealth on the second best land. And likewise, as more settlers come in, they take up land of slightly less, the best land that they can find available in that community, but of slightly less usefulness. And so the, the lower numbers represent the lower potential production that the average worker can make on each grade of land. In our first iteration of the model, we're going to consider wages and interest together relative to rent. That's simply because labor and capital can't do any producing unless they have access to land. So the first consideration is how much do they have to pay to get access to land. So the primary distribution of wealth is between the income for labor and capital that goes to the producers and the income for land, rent, that goes to making the natural opportunities available. So the total product minus wages plus interest equals rent. 
and we'll look at how this plays out on the different grades of land that we saw on our Manhattan map. On the best grade of land, the average person can produce nine units of wealth. On the second best land, the average person can produce eight units of wealth, etc. Now, the best available land that hasn't been put into use yet is where the average person can produce six units of wealth, but since there's more of that land available for free, they can have that land without having to pay rent. Now, if someone wants to work on better land, they're going to have to pay the difference between what they could get where the land is free and the additional advantage of the land that's already owned by someone. On the best land, that difference is three. On the second best land, two, and so on. The best available alternative for self-employment for labor is where the land is free. And so in general, that's going to determine the amount of wealth that goes to wages and interest on all the better lands. Now initially we said that these numbers were arbitrary and just for comparison, but to give our comparison a little bit more context for some kind of reality, we're going to say that subsistence, the level of wealth that you need to keep a person alive for a unit of time, a year's time, equals four in our model. So for example, on the very best land at this fairly primitive level of development, you can produce nine, which is more than subsistence, twice subsistence, but not a huge luxurious amount. So we'll keep in mind as we go forward in the model that bare subsistence in our model is four units of wealth. Okay, after some time goes by, word goes out that Manhattan is a good place to settle and more people have come into the community. A town is starting to develop. And an interesting thing has happened on our map. The wealth output, the average amount of wealth that each person can produce on a grade of land, has doubled. The reason for that is that people are starting to take advantage of the opportunities available in a growing community. They're able to combine their efforts, for example, to build a bridge or drain a swamp, which no one family could have done. They're able to do the things they specialize in and sell the products so a greater network of exchange begins to, um, to develop. And pretty soon, the amount of wealth that everyone can produce increases because of the efficiencies that come from being in a community. Now, the best land available for the newcomers is land where they can produce 10 units of wealth, which is actually more than they used to be able to produce on the very best unit of land when there were only a couple people there. So the advantages of the synergy of a developing community makes everyone potentially more prosperous. Here's an image from history of basically what we're talking about. This is a drawing of New York City circa 1750, in which you can see that a bustling town has begun to develop. Okay, moving back to our chart, people have gone back to land that was less good than was available for free before because more people have come into the area. However, because of the increase of population, the amount of wealth that you can produce on the best land has gone from five up to ten. This means that the opportunity for self-employment, for labor and capital, is land is where land is free and they can produce ten, so they're not going to be willing to work for anyone else anywhere for any less than ten units of wealth, and what's left over is the rent. And as we said before, you can see how the increase in overall production is concentrated on the best land. For example, although wages and interest on the best land went up four units from six to ten, rent on the best land went up five units from three to eight. Now, we'll keep an eye on that development as our economy grows in the future. Now, so far we've been looking at the productivity of the average worker. And we see that, well, okay, the average worker can go to the frontier and make ten units of wealth, or they can go to the best land pay their rent and be left with 10 units of wealth on the average. So how would they make that decision? Why would one be better than the other? But we've also seen that the increased productivity for the whole society is concentrated on the best land. So to explore how that works out, let's consider two workers who are not average. Let's consider Cindy, who is very industrious, very ambitious, and very smart and she can produce twice the wealth of the average worker. Where would Cindy be better off? Should she go to the frontier or should she go to the better land and pay rent? 
Well, if she goes to the better land, she can produce twice the average. The average is 18, she can produce 36. But the going rent for that land is eight units. And that leaves her with 28 left for herself. On the other hand, if she goes to the frontier, she can produce twice the average. She can produce 20 units of wealth, and she has to pay no rent. She has 20 left for herself. But because she has superior skills and is more productive, she's better off on the good land, even though she has to pay rent. Brad is a little bit lazy. He's not very ambitious, and he's not an overachiever in school. And because of that, he can only produce half the wealth of the average worker. Where would Brad be better off? Well, if he goes to the best land, he can produce half the wealth of the average worker, which is nine. He's going to have to pay the going rent, even though he's not very productive, he still has to pay rent of eight. He's left with only one unit of wealth for himself. He can't really afford to live in the middle of town. However, if he goes to where the land is free, he can produce half the wealth of the average worker, which is five, and he has to pay no rent, and he has five units of wealth to keep for himself. And as we recall, in our model, four units of wealth is subsistence. So even though Brad is half as productive as the average worker, as long as there's usable free land for him to work, he can still make a living. He can still be self-employed. Back to our map, we see that population has continued to grow in our developing community, and wealth output has doubled again. What has caused that? Well, over time, society, society developed technology. Labor-saving technology made every worker much more productive. And we're representing that in our model by doubling average wealth output yet again. Back to our trustee chart. You can see that the addition of labor-saving technology has added to all of the other things that have enhanced productivity and allowed us to double the average output of wealth on every grade of land. Now the margin of production has been pushed back a notch because more people are using more land and more resources. However, the amount of wealth that you can produce on the free land now has grown to 16, which is four times the amount of subsistence. So we're seeing a real prosperous society beginning to emerge. Enter John Jacob Astor, the first of America's great tycoons and far and away the wealthiest man in America in the first half of the 19th century. He made his initial nest egg in the fur trade, but he took his profits and invested it in Manhattan real estate. And he said that if I had it to do over again, I would spend every penny I had on land in Manhattan. Now, Astor didn't build anything on the land that he invested in. He just bought it and he held it and waited for its value to go up. Here is an image of a purchase of a farm that Astor made in the early 19th century on Manhattan Island with the later to, de to be developed street grid superimposed over it. And you can imagine how much the value of that land increased. Now, as our city grows, there's going to be a greater and greater need for the public goods, the things that people need to make life move more smoothly in a big city. Infrastructure. In New York City, here are some very prominent examples. Central Park a place where everybody in the metropolis can enjoy a little bit of nature. In New York City, the provision of safe drinking water through the Croton Reservoir and distribu distribution system was a huge boon to the health and the economy of the city. Public transportation, Grand Central Station and the subway system was something that allowed a great increase in the production and business that could go on in this city. In New York City, 100,000 people were being moved on the subway per day before any car entered the city. These investments increased production vastly, and also, I might add, increased the value of real estate vastly. But there's been a constant struggle and debate over who ought to pay for them. A few years ago, I did a, a seminar like this for a fifth grade class. And I talked about how a community was developing, and at one point, it became a good idea to build a bridge over the river because it would help people get their goods to market from the other side of the river. And so I asked the class, how do you think the community ought to pay for the bridge? And one girl raised her hand and she said, I think they should use the rent. Well, I think she was right. 
Here's an example of a lot in New York City that was a surface parking lot for many, many years. It sold recently for some $35 million. It was a surface parking lot for over 20 years. While very large and very expensive commercial buildings were its neighbors. You'll notice that a subway stop is right next door to this lot. So not only is it a valuable lot in Midtown Manhattan, it has the publicly provided public transportation system right there, making it an even pricier lot, an even more valuable place. But it didn't pay much to have that subway stop there. We know that because the property tax on a parking lot is a lot lower than the property tax on a large commercial building. Now, this is not just a problem that afflicts the center city. It might have the biggest economic impact there because the value of land is greatest in the center city. But what it creates is an inefficient use of land throughout the economy. And this shows itself in the phenomenon of sprawl. The land in cities is used less intensively than it could be, less intensively than infrastructure is provided for it, because after all, there was infrastructure for a big building on that parking lot. They just hadn't decided to build one yet. So cities sprawl out, taking up much bigger land, using much more highways, using much more resources and creating much more pollution than they need to because the phenomenon of land speculation happens at every level from the center of the city all the way out to the hinterland. So the fact that people can collect unearned income from holding land out of use or underusing it while they wait for its value to increase creates the problem of sprawl, which makes our entire economy less efficient and makes it pollute far more than it would otherwise have to. So we see that land speculation is a pervasive phenomenon in the, in the economy and it has profound effects on the distribution of wealth. In our next segment, we're going to look at land speculation in a bit more depth and see, see some of the nuances of how it works in today's economy. Thanks for watching. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science. Check out their website right there. Video work by the incredible Uladzimir Takachu. Look at his stuff here. Our next lesson, what keeps the economy gummed up? Who is the dog in the manger?